the Cary Library. Very happy to be here tonight with Chris Mooney and Chuck Hogan, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in just a minute. First, I wanted to say that you can buy their books um, from Porter Square Books. I think you sent book plates there. No? Okay. Well, you can definitely, we've partnered with Porter Square Books for you to buy books from Chuck and Chris um, from there if you would like to. Um, I'd like to thank the Cary Library Foundation, which supports all of our adult programming. They're really wonderful, and um, we couldn't do this without them. So I'm going to go into some introductions now. Um, Chris Mooney has been hailed as one of the best thriller writers working today by Lee Child and a wonderful writer by Michael Connolly. Chris Mooney is the international best-selling author of 12 novels, most recently The Snow Girls, although now he has a new book out. His fourth book, The Missing, the first in the Darby McCormick series, was a main selection of the International Book of the Month Club and an instant bestseller in over 13 countries. The Mystery Writers Association nominated Chris's third book, Remembering Sarah, for an Edgar Award for Best Novel. Bourne writes to his novels have been sold to 28 territories. He sold over ne nearly 2 million copies of his books. His newest book is called Blood World. It just came out in August, and it's a thriller. It's, it's a it's perfect for this time in, in, the, in, in the world. So um, he's going to tell you a lot more about that. Chuck Hogan is an American novelist, screenwriter, and television producer. He's best known as the author of Prince of Thieves and as the co-author of The Strain Trilogy with Guillermo del Toro. Alongside del Toro, Hogan created the television, television series The Strain, adapting their trilogy of vampire novels. Hogan also wrote the crime novels The Standoff, The Blood Artist, The Killing Moon, and The, da the Devils in Exile, and the screenplay for the war film 13 Hours, The Secret Soldiers of Benghazi. Prince of Thieves was adapted into Ben Affleck's Academy, Academy Award-winning, no, Academy Award-nominated film The Town. The work, the work won the 2005 Hammett Prize and was called one of the best, 10 best novels of the year by Stephen King himself. So welcome, both of you guys. It's amazing to have you here. Um, I would like to get started by asking you a question about your work, which is um, interesting in that, uh, you know, we have a pandemic going on right now. And, you know, Blood World sort of has to do with a virus of some sort. And the strain has something to do with a virus. Is that right, Chris? Like, uh, there well, with blood... <clears throat> with Blood World, what it is, is it takes place like in the not so distant future. So say in the next two to three years. And <clears throat> all it all it involves is there's no virus, but it involves scientists discover that there are a group of people called carriers. And what that means is they have a gene that is constantly allowing their blood to replenish itself to operate at maximum efficiency. So they look younger than us. They they sleep better, they, they, they have more energy, all of these great, wonderful things, like they're operating at op optimum peakness. And what they find out is if you take, an inf if you have a full body transfusion of carrier blood and you mix it with a certain drug or drugs, it basically works as a fountain of youth that melts away fat. It, it, you know, your libido comes back stronger than ever. You know, your hair grows. You, all of the, you reverse aging, it cures disease. So when my book opens up, what ends up happening is there are carriers in Los Angeles, that's where the book's set, that are being abducted off the streets, the younger the better, and they're sold into what they call blood farms. And the LAPD is looking where these blood farms are and these, how the secret organization works. What about you, Chuck? First of, all, first of all, I love that. I mean, that's awesome. I love that kind of book. I love what you do, but that like is, it's so, it's, <laughs> it's so cool. I mean, you know, I mean, no one's, you know, what's interesting, Chris, no one has, has really stepped into like Michael Crichton's shoes. You know, I don't know how long he's been gone. It's been more than 10 years. Yeah. Um, this feels like that, you know, you take something real and you, you know, you build a, a fictional world around it. It's just, um, I love it. Uh, I love the, the concept. Um, what was your, you're asking me what about? Uh, they were talking about the, she was talking about the virus. Oh, about the virus thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the strain uh, was absolutely, it was a straightforward, um, it was basically vampirism uh, 
uh, as a virus that it spreads like that. So you can, you know, you can, uh, if you're infected, you can infect someone else. It's actually, you know, very, uh, it definitely has overtones with uh, with what's been uh, what's been going on, and that was uh, Guillermo's idea. I mean, way back when we first met in two thousand and six, and he pitched me. Oh wow! So that's going back a ways. Okay. Way back. I mean, that's when we started, you know, really working on it. So um, yeah, so I've uh, I've you know I've, I'm fairly well schooled in uh, viruses and virus spread and things like that. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, we definitely are kind of living in a novel. I mean, if you would, I think if anybody had said we we're gonna kind of shut down the globe in uh, March and April, um, you know, that's definitely feels like a book or a movie uh, and it happened, you know, for uh, basically. So uh, these, are, these are weird times. Chuck, I have a question for you. How many people have come up to you and said, <clears throat> Chuck, I have a great, you know what you should be writing about right now? You should be writing a book about a pandemic. That's what people want to be reading. That's oh, you what mean, you, uh, you mean like in the past six months, people are yeah. like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, this is something you should do. Um, you know what? I haven't gotten out that much, luckily, so I've been spared that. That's one of the good things about, uh, you know, sheltering in place and quarantining myself is that no one suggested that. I mean, I get it. I mean, uh, um, I get it. It's, it really is it's literary and it's kind of movie-like what we're going through, which is, I find interesting because when it happens, it's so unsettling. There's so much anxiety. I'm sure you, like everyone else, I mean, I feel like everybody was having these anxiety dreams throughout April and May, like the entire yeah. globe was sort of, was vibing off the same anxiety, which probably hasn't happened since, I don't know, maybe even prior to, you know, world wars i mean it's it's really yeah. ex extraordinary what's going on and it definitely you know takes a, a psychic toll you can feel it um but no no one's no one's pitched me uh pandemic stuff because uh uh i assume because they're they are the main characters in this uh, in their story right now yeah i get a lot of you know the, i think a pandemic book would really really sell well you should look into that and i go yeah that's that's not how publishing works and that's kind of the last thing they want right now right is a pandemic book right yeah so i have a question oh um, yes please so given that that you know pandemics going on and things um and but mysteries and thrillers and horror are still selling like crazy and obviously being taken out from the library quite a bit so what do you think that is like why what i mean obviously before the pandemic there was, you know, no question about it. But what what do you think draws people to this genre, these genres? I mean, I, I mean, for me, it's sort of a funhouse aspect in the sense that you can get close to fear without any of the repercussions and you get to explore things. And for me, people always want to know, well, why did why do things happen? Why do bad things happen? And 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 thrillers and mystery novels offer some sort of structure to that. And they offer, generally speaking, some sort of resolution to that. And, you know, it's a great antidote of what you want life to be, which is beginning, middle, end, and things get closed off. And as we all know, life does not work that way. And my personal opinion is the human brain is not meant to live in that uncertainty. So we're constantly seeking, you know, things to reassure it, to give it structure. And, you know, it, they're also fun and entertaining. I mean, I love Stephen King. I love, I'm reading Chuck's, I have a copy of Chuck's new one right here, the hollow ones, which we're gonna talk about. But like, I love being taken away by something that is totally mysterious in something that can that at the moment unexplained and i love going on that journey with with a writer what about you chuck what do you think yeah no, i agree with all that i think i think the pandemic kind of bears out the fact that you'd rather you know read about scary exciting life threatening things than live through it you know you want to but i but i i do think people go to you know i mean most thriller movies nowadays are really there's not you know it's 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 kind of unnatural like it's it's superhuman activity so you don't really 
you know, get the decision making. But I feel like still in books and in early books, people go to them just try to think, you know, like what would I do if I was if I was backed into a corner like the character is? What would I do? Um, and then you see how the character plays it out, and either you think, well, that was a good solution, or you think I might might have done it differently. I mean, you can you can sort of exercise that that fight or flight part of your uh, brain and of your makeup <clears throat> without actually having to fight anybody or or run away. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, there. Are, I mean, it's. I think people think about genre and they think that it's kind of limiting and it's kind of predictable. But I mean, I I I think the exact opposite. I think the great thing about genre is that it is just so wide open and you can break yeah, rules. You can um, you know you can you can go anywhere. You can do a historical crime medical zombie you know you could do almost anything um and it's 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 really it's so freeing it really comes down to is this a character that i believe in and is this a situation that i find uh energizing and uh and um compelling yep i agree with you right so do you think that um that your readers look for anything in specifically from you. Um, I notice that you both have very varying books <laughs> with different kind of series and different mm -hmm. kind of topics and things like that. So, but what do your readers, what are they looking for from you and what do they really appreciate? I mean, for me, the thing I always think about, you know, now, you know, now is a really actually a good, good example of this. Like it's back to school time and, you know, we're going, we're all back to school, we're back to work, summer's, you know, fade is kind of officially over, but it's still, you know, it's on a long fade. And I always think of the harried person who's going on a flight or, or, or going to bed and, and giving them something that they can't put down. That's what, those are the books I like to read. That's what I always want to deliver for anyone who picks up my book where they start reading it, they get immersed very quickly. And they're like, all right, just one more chapter, just one more chapter, and I wanna know what happens next. And that's what I always try to do, you know, when I sit down to write. I mean, I sit down really to entertain myself. And I feel as if I can, I have a high standard that I try to meet, and if I can meet that standard, then the reader is really gonna go along with, on that journey with me and experience the characters. Like I'm going through that with, with Chuck's book, The Hollow Ones, and it's, I keep going. And this is just me, you know, I, at the end of the day, like I know like someone like Chuck, like I know Chuck, but when I pick up his book, I'm not going, all right, let's see what Mr. Hogan's doing this time. Like I just go, I pick it up because I'm familiar with his work and I love it. And I just get swept into the story. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm always looking for. And I know with this one, when I put it down, I'm like, mm, I, I'm looking forward to getting back at that at, at a certain time of the day. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, it's a little different for me because, I mean, obviously my co-author, you know, Del Toro, I mean, he definitely, I mean, people expect something, you know, he has a brand and it's yep. an amazing one and he's an amazing guy. Um, so people, you know, certainly, you know, pick up the book uh, expecting certain things from him. So it's kind of fun for me to sort of get out of my own profile and really think along, you know, um, in terms of, not in terms of, you know, what would Guillermo do, but what would, what would the book, you know, what does it involve? Uh, what, it's almost, you know, I'm, I'm kind of playing a role as I write, which is really kind of fun. Um, and it's fun in two ways. It's just fun to do, but it's also fun because as Chris was saying earlier about Stephen King, et cetera, like I love these kinds of books. So it is, such a, uh, it's so much fun to sort of shift out of my profile, which I guess is sort of prime thriller writer into more procedural horror or supernatural um, writing. So I do think there are definitely expectations for a Guillermo del Toro book with me, you know. Um, for my own books, I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think so, probably because the town uh, you know, is still, uh, you know, kind of a well thought of movie. I think people, you know, have some sort of expectation along those lines, which is great because I think it's a great movie. But I, I ascribe to the old uh, Dashiell Hammett uh, maxim, which was, you know, give, give the reader a little more than they bargained for. 
you know, I mean, you come in and I'm going to meet your expectations, but hopefully I'm going to give you a little something more that you weren't looking for. And, um, and uh, yeah, that's my, that's my angle on that. So by the way, tonight, it's night, uh, 10 years ago tonight, I was sitting in Fenway Park at the premiere of the town. Oh, that's right. It was 10 years ago tonight, which was blowing my mind. That sort of popped up on my wife's whatever phone, Instagram. We, I mean, of all the things that I, Chris, you know, of all the things you dream about what's going to happen with your book, yeah. I, hope, I hope it get published. And then it's like, I hope it becomes a movie. And then it's like, I hope it becomes not a terrible movie. And I hope this, that. Of all the things I dreamed about my novel, I never, ever, and I'm a big dreamer, I never envisioned a movie premiere in Fenway Park and that happened and it was so incredible. They set up a screen. I've told you this, but I'm telling you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's they a great set story. up a screen on the third base side dugout. This is this is back when when there were baseball games being played with fans and things. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> no cardboard cutouts. Well, way back. Way back. <laughs> and uh, we were all sitting, you know, in the sort of the the third base side section. Um and watching the movie, and I mean, it was, you know, the whole cast, there was like a red carpet thing beforehand. That was the other cool part. They dropped us off outside, and I had to come through, like, basically, I entered the way the, uh, the ball players do. So I go through, like, the innards, pop out in the dugout, I'm there, go up, red carpet, I do some interviews, nobody cares what I have to say, but this movie starts around, but I move through it, and, um, my wife was with me and then we go find our seat and we watched the movie and it was a it was a beautiful night it was, the weather was perfect uh the projection was great we watched the movie it ended we had like the after party uh, under the right field bleachers and um it was just insane and i cannot believe that it's been that it was 10 years ago um because i'm not 10 years older so I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding how that could be i know that feeling but um but yeah, that's uh, it's that movie's ten years old. That movie is officially an oldie. You know, that's like a that's a uh, it's a classic. It's, it's I I it's agree. Boss, I mean, it's a Boston it a classic. classic. Absolutely, Boston classic. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I mean, everybody. That's how they think of it. Um, but um, but yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, it's been a uh, decade. It's insane. You know what the best part about having a movie made of your book is? Chris, you're like a talker, so I feel like you don't have a problem with it. But with me, when I would meet someone, they're like, oh, what do you do? I'm a novelist. What, have you, what do you write? Have I read it? And you have to sort of go through five minutes of, I wrote this, and maybe you read that, and no, you know. Right, right. The great thing about a movie is like, well, I, you know, I could just cut all that out and just say, I wrote the book that became the movie of the town. They're like, oh, great. And oh. it saves me five minutes of blah, 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 um, which I love. Uh, less talking is, uh, is good for me. So you not you find, you don't find I think you're a pretty good talker. I, I don't I mean it's it's just it takes so much energy you know you like you that I get. I've my, yeah. my kids are getting older now but when I coached it's funny I go all day you know writing and not talking to anyone except speaking in my head and I right. just found like after talking straight at like children or anyone for fifteen minutes I was like exhausted I'm like <laughs> just got kids carry on. Coach Chuck has to sit down and rest his voice because I just I'm just like so out of practice. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's what I appreciate about about it. Just having to having to uh, give the short version of who you are, and then we can move on to more interesting things. So I actually saw some pictures of you, Chuck, on the red carpet for the strain. So was that a strain oh, yeah. for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm used to red red carpets. It's just it's old hat. Oh, please. Yeah, no, the strain. We premiered the premiere episode at the Directors Guild Auditorium in um, Los Angeles on Sunset Boulevard, and uh, it was cool. It's it was TV, so it's a lot different from uh, movies, but it was great. I mean, honestly, the pictures that you saw are like the best part of it. I mean, you know, uh, Guillermo and I, uh, the other uh, actors and uh, everyone, and uh, obviously my wife got to jump in on pictures uh, too, and. Um, it was fun. It was, it was, it, it, it's weird watching a TV show in a theater. Um, it's just not, you know, it's not really meant to be that way, but it was, it was kind of fun. I, I say that, but the premiere, uh, the pilot of The Strain wasn't really like a TV show because Guillermo directed it. We had a, you know, a, a much more uh, time, uh, production time than usual. So it was, it was a big league affair. But, um, 
Yeah, and then uh, just, I mean, since we're talking, my other red carpet experience was on 13 Hours. And for that, mm. incredibly, um, again, and you know what? I'm just, I'm just now realizing it's another stadium at, uh, where the Cowboys play, Cowboys Stadium. That's where the premiere was. And you know how they had that massive screen? You're a football fan, Chris. You know, they've got that giant, giant four-sided screen up there. Yeah. That's what they played it on. But we walked in through there, and you had to, like, speak a little bit. And the big crowd um, who were super energized, and all the – not all, but most – actually all, but only some of them got up to speak – of the guys who the movie was about um, uh, were there uh, to get their moment in the sun, which was great. And uh, that was crazy. That was a Texas-style mm. premiere um, in every sense of the word. So one of the things I read, and I know you guys can chat all, all evening, but I'm just going to go in with some questions. Great. Uh, yeah. One of the things I read was that the great thing about both of your books um, is really not just the, the, the mystery and the thriller aspect of it, of like what's going to become next, but the humanity in it that you really uh, care about your characters and that you, um, you know, you root for them, obviously. So how, you know, like, can you talk a little bit to that? How, you know, how do you um, get to that point in a thriller where, you, you know, some people are like, oh, it should be nonstop action, but you really, it's not. It, there's much more to it. Right? Yeah, you can't, I mean, the thing with action is, and I'm thinking of, I'll use a I'll, I'll use a, a a movie as an example a movie I like, but it was the the Superman reboot with H Henry Cavill. How do you pronounce his last name? Cavill. That's it. Cavill. Okay. Yeah. So it's like there's not you know the action starts. There's all this nonstop action, but like a fatigue factor sets in because your adrenaline jumps and you can't sustain it. And at some point, actually like the Transformers movies, I took my son mm -hmm. to see those. It's like, okay, the robots are gonna smash each other against buildings. And it goes on for 10 minutes. You're like, okay, well, what's next? And the same thing happens in a book where, where you want to, you know, you want that, you wanna be able to spend time with the character, something happens. And then when something stops, you wanna be able to regroup and then set yourself up for the next thing, but the most important point of any story, whether it be a book or film, is it's all about the characters. And those quiet moments where the character is wrestling with something or wrestling, you know, you know, verbally with someone, those can be just as dramatic and tense as like a big action thing. And Chuck can speak to this too. Writing action in a book, I for me anyway is much more difficult and labor intensive than it is in a screenplay where it's like, car blows up, boom, you know, it's, there's an art to it. And I'm not saying I'm good at it. There's guys who are really, really good at it, but you know, it actually takes a lot of finesse, I think, so fatigue doesn't set in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's not, it shouldn't be like, is the character going to survive this or not? Because right. most likely they are, but it's like, how are they going to be affected? What is this going to do to them? Um, and that can come in the first minute of the movie that can come, that should come on page, you know, well, by page five, just, and it doesn't have to be, a, you know, um, an explosion or something major, but just something that happens in this person's life that throws them off their, uh, throws them off their trajectory. I remember with uh, the town, I mean, what, one of the, one of the germs of the story for me was, I had watched this crime recreation television show where a bunch of guys go into a bank to rob it and they make a lot of noise and they grab a woman who is maybe working there or maybe not and they, you know, yell, 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 get the money and they run outside and they toss her to the curb and they jump in the van and they drive off. And we follow them as they go off. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. what about the woman who was grabbed out of the bank and almost brought in the van and thrown to the curb? I'm like, that's the story for me like right. that her life is changed forever and if she gets in the van who knows i mean all bets are off but just the simple fact that you go in to get change or to cash a check or whatever and all of a sudden you're in fear uh, of your life uh, you're never the same again and it's that's kind of simple but it's super profound too because when it happens um you know um yeah i mean you you look at everything uh at everything uh differently and it's it, it's it's like that 
but in a thriller, it, you know, it's like that. And it could be, you know, a plane is, cra is crashing or uh, someone with semi superhuman abilities is, uh, is, you know, coming after you. Um, but what's that going to do, you know, to this, to this character? That's, that's the, uh, as a writer, that's what pulls me through the book is figuring out how they're going to grapple with that and how that spins the story into hopefully uh, a slightly different uh, direction going ahead. Yeah, one of my favorite, going back to that, and it's, it's something Chuck did, and it's something I always think about is I love the, I love ideas that create this ominous mood. And I'm thinking of, and I don't think I'm giving anything away, and if I am, Chuck, stop me. But in the beginning, the first book of the Strain trilogy, you know, and you see it in the pilot, is this, this plane is landing. And it's basically landing on autopilot, and nobody in the tower, the tower's trying to talk to the pilot or get someone on mm -hmm. the plane to talk. They can't get anyone to talk. Mm -hmm. So this thing is coming down and landing on autopilot, and everyone's there going, what's going on and then you see some of the characters start to come in and what's going to happen to them and i love i love being on that journey with the characters where you see you know you see like the first wave go into the plane and you see all the i won't give anything away but this stuff that happens on the plane and that's the thing that kicks off the story and i love those really cool set pieces that really grab you and they they're so indelible in a lot of ways than like a big shootout car chase sort of a thing because i like that ominous feel mm -hmm. uh, it give it gives off For and sure. go, and, yeah and then the other thing is in these types of books i mean almost always and sometimes it's something good sometimes it's not that interesting but like i'm thinking about the description of your book you learn something too you know yeah. i mean you, you as, as it's going along and as you are gripped and thrilled, you are actually learning some things in a really, you know, fun way that doesn't feel like you're learning anything at all, be it how do armored cars work or, you know, uh, you know, what would it be like to have enhanced, um, you know, uh, physical ability and things like that, you know, but how, how does that, how could that come about? Um, I always find that that cool and that cuts across that's a great thing about like even I watched Goodfellas again a few nights ago and you learn stuff about how you know yeah. how the uh, how the uh, mafia works um, casino same thing you know how, how does you know uh, how do what's the inner workings of the of the casino and and such and I think that's a really underestimated um, uh, feature of thrillers is uh you know it, it takes you into into places that you wouldn't normally go and you and they just you know hopefully you can find a way to make it interesting for the reader so they're learning and i feel like that also helps to pull you along as you are accumulating knowledge not just about the characters but about what they do and, and how they do what they do yeah and, and speaking of that like in blood world i had to basically come up with, all right, well, what would an organization that sells blood on the black market look like? Mm -hmm. Who would be the guy in charge? How would you, how would, how would a successful person do this? And, you know, for me, it was creating like, all right, well, I'm going to have a guy, this guy named Sebastian Kane, who, and I'm not giving anything away. His front is he's just a real estate agent and he owns a real estate agency in, in Los Angeles. It's not one of the big fancy ones. He kind of flies under the radar. But he has this intricate network of, of, of clinics and all of this other stuff and places where he keeps, where his blood farm is, where he, where he keeps people. And, you know, yeah, you, like what Chuck was saying, you pick up things along the way, which is, oh, this is how this sort of thing could work. And, oh, this is how someone can hide their identity or money or what have you. And, that, yeah, that's, that's one of the great things when, when you're reading or watching a film is that you pick up those things. It makes it so much more immersive and real. So, so wh where did you, how did you come up with, uh, like, where, how, how did this book get born in your, in your mind? It was, you know, I read a story, I think it was in Wired magazine, and it was basically about uh, Silicon Valley types who, where made like billions of dollars in tech and now they're using all of their brain power and financial resources to hack longevity and they've found 
you know, there's been, there's been talk about, well, if you get a full body transfusion from a younger person, you know, the blood will make you feel better and all of this other stuff. And they've been experimenting with medications with it, one of which was a, di a well-known diabetes drug. So there's all of this stuff going on in Silicon Valley. And all I did was take it a step further and said, well, what if that actually did happen? What would the landscape look like? And when that's what happens when Blood Worlds opens, is that this thing happens and all of a sudden it's like, oh, pe you know, people can make money off of something like this. Mm -hmm. And people are going to take, you know, illegal types are going to take matters into their own hands. And that was, there was some minor world building there, but that was also, it, it, world building is fun and you can speak to this too. It's fun on one hand and at the other time it can be draining because there's so many different avenues you can go down. And like, I'm sure you, you yourself went through this when you were doing the hollow ones because there's a supernatural, again, without giving anything away, there's a supernatural aspect, but mm -hmm. it's a particular supernatural aspect mm -hmm. that's based, my understanding, in some reality, or did you make, am I wrong, you made it up? Um, I mean, no, it's, I mean, I'm not sure what part you're referring to. Are you referring to the hollow ones themselves, or are you referring to... Yes. The... Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, well, it's, it's sort of, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a one way to explain things that happen in real life. You okay. know, it, it's was one way to sort of come up with that. But yeah, world building is tough because, you know, the worst thing you can do is build a world and then painstakingly explain it. Like, oh, I mean, yeah. I, you know, books like that, I just glaze over because, you know, I mean, just can't do it. So it's, it's really tricky to evoke the world that you've built without you know by just showing the tip of the iceberg and implying right. the other 90 percent and not you know laboriously going into it that's for me that i mean it's difficult to build a world but then it's even you know you have to keep in mind how am i going to uh you know uh, express this in a way that is compelling and that doesn't feel like oh he's laying out the world and right it doesn't feel like these three stuff. paragraphs yeah absolutely yeah lots of uh, of exposition um I'm sorry so i asked about the genesis now let me i'm just curious like do you foresee other uh adventures in this realm or is this a complete one i mean i designed it i designed it as a the answer to the question is yes could there be more sure it's it's a big expansive type of universe um but you know the thing i try to do with series and you can speak to this too is that you know with the darby mccormick series i <clears throat> i always want someone to be able to pick up a book no matter where it is in the series and you know what's going on right. and then if you know if you read them in order great and if you don't no big deal so taking that concept to blood world that's something i wanted to do in this so if there's more of them you can kind of pick up at any time and it may be about different characters or different phases of blood world development and, and how it goes. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, I get that. Um, here's the other question that we haven't talked about, which I'm really curious about because I was trying to think of it today. When did we first meet? It was at a, it was at a crime writing conference, was it not? I'm trying to, Yes, I think Must have been, it, right? yeah, it was I think it was San Francisco because I remember no, it wasn't San Francisco. What? so let me tell you I have met of that many. I went to Boucher it was Con the Boucher Con one in Chicago. I went to one in Toronto. Maybe it was the Chicago oh. one. Was it the Chicago one? It might have been. I don't I thought it was that one it definitely not san francisco no okay. I, would, I, I would remember that uh but i think we met for a beer or something before that it's possible that's yeah. totally possible because I'll, I'll, I'll tell this story chuck probably, probably he's heard this like a billion times and he probably hates hates hearing this but i do when i was in my 20s and you know he, chuck wrote a book how old were you when you wrote the standoff it was um, it was published when I was twenty six. So okay. I wrote it when I was twenty five, twenty six. 
So I remember there was, you know, there's a story in the Herald or maybe the Globe or both where it's a, you know, 20 something year old guy who was working at a blockbuster, wrote a book called The Standoff. You know, it was published. There was a lot of publicity about it. It got picked up for a movie and all this other stuff. And I was like, wow, you know, that's what I want to do. And I want to see, you know, I was in my 20s. I'm like, do, do I have what it takes, you know, at this stage of my life to, to write something like this? Because I was, I was really impressed by that. So the thing I, I got, I got a copy of it at the Barnes and Noble in downtown Boston. I remember going on my lunch hour to go get it. And I devoured it in, I think, two days. And for me, that's the highest praise I can give another writers because I'm so slow and I read. <laughs> and the thing that I loved about, the thing I loved about it was I, it, all of my expectations when I was reading, they were blown. I loved, and I won't give in, I loved the beginning. Mm -hmm. I loved how it ended. I did not expect that. And, you know, I've been, that's the thing I've always, I mean, I obviously like Chuck as a person, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't in, <laughs> be doing this, but, you know, he, in his books, they're always, I never know what's coming. And as a, as a writer who does this for a living, you, you can get, not jaded, but you can pick up something and go, okay, this is what's going to happen next. Okay, here's the red herring. Okay. That, mm -hmm. And when you're with a, a writer that you really, really like, King, Hogan, you know, whoever, it's always great to get swept along in that and be, and, and, and be surprised. But, and I, I know I veered off the topic, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's how we met and we were both from Boston and you know, there was, a, there was a small stable of us here, mm -hmm. you know, us, Lehane, who's now in California, mm -hmm. and some other guys. So it was kind of a really small world. And, you know, it was great to kind of connect with, connect in with everyone. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Yeah. So that's like, it's going to be like 1995. So that's 25 yeah. years ago, Chris. I'm just saying 25 years ago. When we, uh, wait, no, 95? No, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, 2005, 2005. Hold on, no, we're much old. younger than I thought. 15 years ago, we're good, we're good, we're good. Woo, uh, uh, time's moving fast. Yes. Yeah, 15 years though, wow, that's... Uh, that's uh, it goes by fast, as they say. <laughs> um, uh, so can I ask a question? Absolutely, oh, yes, please. Yes. please um, this is one of my favorites um, my, a, a recent, question is, are you a planner or a pantser? I mean, and I would think like with a mystery, you have to be more of a planner, but I've heard other pe people say they're not. So I'm just wondering what your process is. I'm going to ask Chuck first, because I'm very curious as to what, I had never asked him this. So that's a great question. I bet that he does both. I am, well, I do. I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, and I have tried it yeah, I've been writing for a long time. I actually have been doing this for like 25 years. So I've done it both ways. I've been like, you know what, I'm going to kind of, you know, let it fly. And because sometimes, Chris, you know, writing a book takes, it can take between, I mean, this is the shortest it's ever taken me. It was like nine months. And the longest is like three years. I mean, it can, it's a long time. So you've got to keep yourself yeah. interested. And um, so I've done it where I've planned it all out, where I'm like, I'm going to write the book before I write the book. And then I'll just sail through it. And it really kind of kills it. And you got to refine that energy. And I've tried it the other way where I'm like, all right, I'm not going to figure it all out. And I'm going to, you know, explore it. And then you can get kind of lost. So, um, I, you know, my uh, process is constantly evolving. That's one of the, the fun slash weird things about being a writer is that, you know, you keep sort of finding new ways to do it. But I definitely need to go know where I'm going. Um, and I think this is, I mean, I... I mean, hats off to, to any writer who can write without knowing the ending, but I would be, I, I wouldn't know what to write, you know? I mean, right. I have to have something to work toward. At the same time, if it's too planned out, then where's the fun? So, uh, you know, it's not A, B, C, D, E, but it's like A, B, E, G, you know, and all the way to, to Z. So I know where I'm going and I know how to get there, but I don't have every gas station and restaurant, you know, marked off on the trip to kind of, you know, kill the journey before it, it begins. Because really, I mean, because you do find things in the day, it doesn't happen all that often, but sometimes something occurs, maybe you're the same, Chris, and you're like, wow, 
I didn't plan on that. And then maybe you think about it for a day or two and either you do it or you don't, and that can change things going ahead. So along with, you know, along with planning, the best laid plans sometimes uh, get changed uh, because you get a better idea over the course of many, many months of, of, uh, of, of hard work. So it's both. Um, but definitely you need to, you need to leave room for those, uh, for those, you know, creative moments or else, uh, you're going to, uh, or else it's going to, it's going to be a long, a long haul. That's my take on it. Mr. Mooney. Thank you, Mr. Hogan. I, in my answer is I've done both. Usually I will say, I mean, I'm like Chuck. I, I find writers come in two, two categories, which is. There are writers like me who go, I have an idea for a book. This is how it's going to open. This is how it's going to end. I have no idea what's going to happen in between. But like Chuck was saying, is I, I know where I'm going and where I'm heading, and that's kind of my direction. Then there's writers who don't think along those lines. They think in terms of character. Like I have a character, and they spend time with the character, and they get to know the character before they put like a plot or structure on it. So for me, one of the things I found is the more I do this and the more that's demanded of me, I like the idea of plotting something out. Like here's chapter one and I'll give it in chapter two and, and I'll go through it and I'll do, this is the first time I'm doing a really detailed outline for something. But I like, I rather do the outline uh, stage for something, for a thriller I'm doing that has a lot of moving parts so that way, if something's not working, I can change something in an outline and I don't have to rip up, you know, days mm -hmm. or whatever of, mm -hmm. of something that I wrote. Because that, yeah. for me, can get very demoralizing quickly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, as, as, as I'm sure you know. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I, I co-write with, with James Patterson and he has, and I just started that, and, you know, he has a very detailed thing of where it wants to go and I thought that that would kill creativity and for me and I could just speak for myself there's something relaxing about being able to sit down and knowing where I'm going to go and by being that relaxed going to what Chuck says you have those moments where it's like oh I had an idea for something so I'll give you a quick example that involves Blood World which was I, I kind of had it all plotted out so when I sat down to write it you know, I wrote the first chapter, <clears throat> excuse me. And then as I'm writing and I'm relaxed because I know where I'm going, I had this idea for this opening scene that was really shocking and stuff. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I should write that. And that part, that writer part of me says, no, 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 no. You should definitely include that. You definitely include that. And I hemmed and hawed and I, I decided to, to write it. And then I gave the, the pages to my agent before they, you know, they go to the editor and I get the phone call and he's like, uh, you know, I, I read the pages you sent and I said, uh, sure, what would you think? He's like, we got to talk about that thing that you added. And I go, what's, uh, what's wrong with you? He goes, I, I can't submit this to the editor. The editor's going to think you're out of your mind. <laughs> you know, it was very, just say it was okay. risky. I'll just say that. Okay. So, you know, and also I was like, I don't know if I want to write this. I don't want people to think that's where my, this is where my brain is <laughs> the thing. As I'm sure you've been, you've been there, Chuck. But so we hemmed and hawed, hemmed and hawed. And I said to, to, to the, to my agent, I said, listen, at the end of the day, just give it to the editor. If they don't like it, because I was meeting with the ed editor and editor board and all this other stuff. I said, if they don't like it and they're like, what's this? Just go, yeah, yeah, I know. He wanted to try this. You can blame the whole thing on me. So when we went to New York, we had a meeting in the conference room and they were all sitting there. And the, that scene I wrote was the, was the elephant in the room. And I remember going, all right, let's talk about the elephant in the room. What did you guys think? And there was these two young women to my right, one who's really, really smart with story stuff. And I'm looking at her face and she goes, yeah, that scene. And I'm like, oh, sh oh shoot, here it comes. It's gonna be bad. She goes, I gotta be honest with you, we, re, we really, really loved it. So that changed the direction of the book a little bit, mm -hmm. but because I had that outline, I could recalibrate things and I wasn't tearing, you know, what's left of my hair out of my head. Mm -hmm. So that's, 
I, it's a little bit freeing, but there's, a, there's pros and cons to both, as, as Chuck was saying. So you're yeah, both I mean, planters. Yeah. Yeah, planters, that's a good word. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. yeah. Play, okay. Planters. Yeah, planters. You, Chuck, so, do you find it's different when you're doing a script versus a book? Um, I do, but that's generally, generally, you know, there are like steps in the script. So you have to, you know, you have to talk about it and you have to just kind of pitch it and then you have to do an outline and then you might have to do a treatment. So you're right. kind of, it's kind of built into it where they want to know, you know, uh, where you're going. This is if you're hired to write something. If I'm going to write my own script, obviously I can do whatever. Whatever you want, but, right. But generally, you know, uh, you want to, and I mean, it's, Honestly, it's better for me too to know what they're at least thinking about or expecting. So, you know, so I don't uh, work on it for whatever amount of time, and then they're like, "This is not, not yeah, this is not expecting. what we're expecting." Right yeah. now, hold on, James Patterson. We're going to yep. go back. Okay, go back. As my kids say, pause. Pause. They say that during conversation. They're like, pause. I'm like, you don't have to say pause. Do they give you the hand. Dad, I have a question. Pause. Do they go pause. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so I was also in pause. So, so have you, have you, you haven't met with them, have you? I no, I've only talked to them over the phone. It's been not. I feel like it's like it's like a Charlie's Angels thing. It's probably not on the phone. It's probably just a speaker on your desk, and you just and you hear from him. That's that's what, how I picture it. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, it is kind of. I mean, isn't it kind of freeing to kind of get, you know? I mean, because look, what, here's what we do. You and I, we're kind of wildcatters, right? Like we write books, and we are. It's us. We're playing singles tennis. We got to come up with the character or the plot. We yep. have to assume that it's going to be something that readers want to get and that publishers want to buy and that critics want to like. And it's kind of all on us. Like every decision, every yes. everything from the carpets to, you know, the character's blood type, it's all us. Right. So when you're given, if someone says, look, the character is, is a bus driver and it's set in Cleveland, and the year is 1992. You're like, I don't know anything about any of those things, but here I go. And you sort of take the givens, but the big questions, which we wrestle with, I, I'm speaking for you, but I know yep. you feel the same. You're like, is this the time to write a book about this? Or does this character, is it gonna work? Those are taken off the table and you just have to, you have to create something with the pieces you're, uh, given it's almost like macgyver we're like it's like a macgyver thing like you get you know you've got a right. brush and you've got a paper clip and you have to make something out of it and um you know it's a challenge and it's kind of you know it's almost like i can see that people do like writing ex exercises in that way but when you really have to do that yeah i mean it's kind of freeing you, you take your you take out the existential questions of is this book ever going to sell am i spinning my wheels for nothing and you're like all right um, I'm going to make this work and you, and you get in there and it's really, you know, I find it's, uh, so long as you have your own stuff to go back to, I find it really kind of energizing and exciting to, uh, to learn something new and to yes. put it all together. That's how I feel. The thing I yeah. love about writing is learning all the new stuff. So it's like, all right, I'm working with someone. What, what's his process? Like, okay, it's this, this, and this. All right, I'm doing a, a script. Okay. They want this, this, and this, or a pilot or something. And I love, and I, I'm assuming you're this way too. I mean, I love collaborating. So I love getting the input from trusted sources or people I respect, just because it will get, it re-energizes me for the project. Cause I see like, oh, that's a great idea. And have you thought about this and where to go with that? And it, it kind of frees me up instead of being, that lone decision maker that you were talking about, like, is it, you know, oh my God, is this good? Cause you can talk your way out of something very quickly. Is this good enough? A series dead. What about this character? What if I'm doing this wrong? You're like, you're dealing with all of that stuff up there mm -hmm. before you even start writing. So yep. yeah, I, I love collaborating and bouncing ideas off of people. So when you go, when that happens, and it will happen, when you go down to play tennis with Patterson. Yes. Can I come along? And yes, I'm not. I think he's I more playing of a tennis golfer. myself, but I want to be what? I think he's more of a golfer. I don't know. I feel like I feel like I read somewhere it was tennis. Maybe not. Maybe it is golf now. If it's golf, forget it, because my God, I'm terrible at that golf. But I am too. Yes, I could I could come along and uh, I could I could add something there. That's all I'm saying. Think about it. Okay. okay. It, it's a, it's a date. 
So we have a, um, a comment and a question from Facebook. Jim says, hi, Chris, Jim Kelly. And Milton says, you both have idea boards behind you. How do you use them for long periods of time? I, well, I got one two years ago. And the reason why I do it is with so many projects going on and different ideas for things, like having kind of one area where I can see everything. And if I have ideas for something or something I need to do, I can just kind of jot it on the board instead of having, you know, a thousand post-it notes scattered around the office, like I'm some sort of um, mental patient, mm -hmm. which is the way my office used to look. So I have one here behind me and then I have another, you can't see it, but I have another long whiteboard in front of me with this like all writing business stuff I have to do, which is all of Chuck's favorite things like websites and social media mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. I'll take it. I had to do another, do a new author photo, stuff like that. Oh, fun. Yeah, fun stuff. Um, my, uh, my, my daughter, who is, uh, uh, well, she does photography as like a minor in college. She actually took my author photo this time. So it was so cool to oh, see nice. her. We had a, a review in the Washington Post and like my picture was there. It was credit Melanie Hogan. That was awesome. That was really, that was really cool. Um, but yeah, the whiteboard, you know, I was, when I was working on, uh, the last book that I published on my own, which was Devils in Exile, and I was working on the, um, the script at this uh, production company in LA, and they had a whiteboard, and we were using it like crazy, and I was like, wow, this is really, really good. Like, I'm going to get one. I came home, and I got one, and I put it up, and I used it for a while, and I still use it, but I don't, you know, I mean, I don't use it as much as I thought, it, but it is great for exactly what you said. If something occurs, I could just, you know, uncap and scribble it down, and I don't have to... And then it'll be there later and I'll, and I'll see it. Um, my kids love it because they, you know, when they were younger, they would come in and just fill it up with all sorts of stuff. The kids come in and like doodle on it for you? Oh yeah, all the time. Oh yeah. I mean, well, I mean, they used to, they don't, yeah, now they're a little too old for doodling. I used to do, I tried for a while, I had like a cork board up with, yeah. uh, you know, cards and pins. But I remember we had, uh, we had a party and I had some friends over and uh, it was fine. And then the next day I'm going to work and I'm looking up and there were some like new cards and they were trying to throw off the book with all these, you know, weird turns and I'm like, that's dangerous. I have to, I can't, you know, uh, can't do that because uh, they ruin, ruin these books for me. But um, no, it's, I mean, I, I do like it. I do like having it. Um, I, think it's, I think it's more useful when it's more than one person because you, get, you can really sort of draw and make notes and sort of yeah. put them together. Um, but I like it. I like it. I had no idea that you had the same. This is not surprising. No, I find, it's funny. I find we were talking about this earlier, how writers are, um, when it comes to their offices, it's a combination of workspace and I, I don't know, toy room or knickknacks and just weird stuff. Like, it, you know, I get, when I sit down to work as I'm facing it, I can't turn it, but I have, one of the big figures from uh, Alien that's mm -hmm. looking at me. And I just, I love that. And my friend Jim Kelly was just on a moment ago, would look at that and go like, why, why do you have that on your desk? Like, well, how old are you? And what's the purpose of looking at that? Um, do you let, which brings me to the question, do you usually let people in your office? I don't. Well, I mean, it used to, my office used to be more accessible. Now it's up, uh, I'm on like, I'm like next to a, uh, to a bedroom here so they don't oh, no, nice. they don't they don't generally i mean the kids do but uh, right strangers yeah, uh i frown on i frown on uh, strangers um coming in no i think i mean you know what I, the cool like like you i have all sorts of things i have the dog Zayas right uh, on the other side of my monitor over there from planet of the apes i mean i oh, cool. i gotta keep that 14 year old yep alive um because that's where i mean that was you know probably my most like creative age and that's when movies and tv to a lesser extent and books like meant you know a lot and yep. and uh and you know you gotta you gotta keep that you have to keep that creative force uh going so i find the little knickknacks little toys and things remind me you know this is because you can get bogged down you you know it you're, you're writing, 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 and you kind of lose the forest for the trees. And you got to remind yourself, like, this is, it's a privilege to do what we do. 
It's supposed to be fun. You got to keep it creative and, um, you know, uh, go for it. You know, try to try to come up with something that will affect other people the way our favorite books and authors and movies affected us. Um, so, yeah, that's... I agree with you 100%. Like, so Stephen King, you know, you know, is a huge prominent role in my life. Mm -hmm. In the in those moments, for, it's that childhood thing, and you just mentioned that, and it's so true that we able, it's having these almost totems of different things that can connect you into your childhood. And like, I just sure. remember still, like I have one of the original Star Wars posters, it's across the hall. And I just remember being a kid and being totally swept away by that story. And it was like one of the first times in my life where something consumed my attention for whatever it was an hour and a half and mm -hmm. it felt like five minutes and I never wanted it to end. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I actively search for that as an adult with books and films, TV shows and all that. Like I'm a huge junkie in a lot of ways for, for that, that, that rush and yeah. having those things, like you were saying, I agree with you, having those toys or, like I'm looking at Darth Vader right now. Um, having those things just reminds me of you gotta, it's supposed to be fun and creative and you yep. have to access that childhood part of yourself to be able to do this. Yep, yep, yeah. Yeah, and it's a great excuse to buy toys. Exactly. <laughs> I, and I, you know, I said to my wife, hey, listen, you know, it's a business write-off. I, I need this. It's I an need office. It. I need this $400 Millennium Falcon <laughs> thing that's going in my office. I gotta have it. <laughs> So we're about out of time, but I did okay. want to ask, um, you, you know, uh, what's next for you? It sounds to me like, um, you know, Blood World just came out mm -hmm. and Chuck, you have this new book coming out with Guillermo del Toro soon. But, um, and it seems to me like you guys have done some amazing collaborations with, with who to me, like are the pinnacles, you know, Stephen King, James Patterson, Ben Affleck. Yeah, you know, it's just amazing. So what, what could be more for you? What's next and what could be, what would be more for you? Well, for me, I, I have uh, a book that will be coming out with James Patterson uh, early next year. And it's, it's actually nonfiction. It has to do with, I don't know if I can announce the title yet, but it has to do with soldier stories. So we, we they interviewed all of these soldiers and they told you know their tales of combat and other like coming home and you know the effect it had on their family and stuff and i'm really he called and asked if uh, i would be willing to work with him on that and i was super psyched to to do that and to have my name associated with, with such an important thing as that so i'm doing that that's coming out next and I'm doing a couple of more projects with him. And I've started uh, my, an, another book, the outline piece and, and there's a script or something. I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to do like a horror thing. Cause it's been knocking on my head to Chuck knows what that is. It's like, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. So I'm going to try to be doing that over the next few months. Okay. Cool. Wow, that's good. Um, yeah, so Guillermo and I are, uh, we're, we are going to, um, we're going to do another, um, another book. We're writing another, another uh, book in this same uh, vein, which is, which is awesome, um, which is really, really fun. I'm actually, I'm, uh, I'm super excited. I haven't published a book of my own, a crime book, for last one was 10 years ago in uh, 2010 oh, wow. and I'm finishing up um, my first, you know, uh, crime book in that many years. Probably won't be out until early 2022 now, I'm guessing, uh, but uh, it'll be done by the end of the year, but it's, um, it's really good. I'm really excited about it. It's kind of based on a true story with a fictional element in it. Um, super excited for that and it's been great to get back to that it really has in fact working on the hollow ones kind of recharged me in terms of you know it's been too long since i wrote just fiction and i uh and i had to do it so i did that um i have i have some other you know i have some some scripts that uh are that have directors i mean nothing's getting made now because of the pandemic but hopefully production will start up 
publishing projects too, but you know, it's all, everything's kind of in, uh, in a holding pattern now um, in terms of those, you know, in terms of, uh, of production on those. But um, yeah, a lot of uh, uh, exciting things um, ahead. But, um, but yeah, it's great. I mean, I'm super excited to have a book of my own out. I can't believe that it's been so long. And yet I, yeah, can't, I can't either. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been that long. And uh, it's great to go back and just sort of do something on my own, you know, and not have to, right. um, all the other, uh, all the other stuff uh, that goes with either getting a movie made or, or a TV project. So, so is this going to be a trill? I just want to ask, it's not going to be a trilogy. It um, is going to be a trilogy. Okay. It's not going to be a trilogy. I mean, it's not a trilogy yeah. in the sense like the strain was a beginning, right. middle, and end. This is more of a series. Oh, um, okay, right. So yes, so this is a series. Um, how long will it go? We're not. Yeah, Don't we're, okay. we're going to see. We, we'll see what happens, but um, but there's definitely more to come. Yes. Great. So I'm back. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, I can't wait for everything you just talked about, your, the books that you just had out, the movies, the, uh, the standalones. It just sounds amazing. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you to our attendees, and thank you to people on Facebook for joining us. And um, remember, you can buy Chuck and Chris's books at Porter Square Books or any indie bookstore, or you can get them from the library. Um, just read. We all mm -hmm. love reading. Mm -hmm. um, thank read. you so much. Thank you Thanks. very, very much. Thank you all. <laughs> bye bye, everyone. Bye bye.